Hello guys and gals, and welcome! Uh, so today I'm going to be starting a new series. It's going to be a pretty simple series, but uh, a little bit complicated at the same time. And basically, what is it going to be? Well, it's going to be mercenaries. Um, what I want to do is I want to go over specific setups for mercenaries, uh, talk about why specific setups are better than others, uh, the gear that you potentially need for them, alternative pieces of equipment, and so forth and so on. And uh, and to do this, we ha really have to categorize everything, and we really have to break it up into different categories of equipment styles. Um, and a lot of people may not uh, know what I'm talking about, but let me just go over this really quickly. There's a couple different trains of thought for equipping your mercenary. Um, the first train of thought is equipping your mercenary for the mercenary. So this is called the for the merc category. Um, and basically what this means is, is that the equipment is specifically designed to enhance only the mercenary uh, and not you. We can actually even put that in there. Not you. Um, this is a, a method of making the mercenary into a master class, like ridiculous monster style damage output character. Um, you're basically just making it so that your mercenary does as most the, the most amount of damage that they possibly can. Um, number two, um, and a very easy way to set up your mercenary is what I would call the tank. Uh, the tank mercenary is literally just designed to tank. Um, that's entirely the goal of the mercenary. Um, obviously, the main goal of a tank is to not die. So, to not die. Um, and tank mercenaries generally tend to be things like uh, shaft stop, uh, you know, like large amounts of damage reduction in the cows, or something like Kira's and Guardian Angels for a um, an alternative setup for like a mercenary on uh, the Act Two Merc thing. Like if you're doing like Trav and Call and stuff like that, it's a it's a whole nother school of thought. Um, number three is utility. Um, a utility mercenary is generally set up to assist the player. Um, and this is, um, this can also include some of the for damage types uh, because you, you can still have a utility uh, mercenary that's not set up specifically for utility, but still has a utility, uh, you know, like bonus there. There's, there's like something extra that the mercenaries do. Um, and, and these are basically the three main ways that you can set up your mercenary. Um, there is one additional way, which we may not be covering in this guide because it's a pretty simple one, and it basically just involves magic find. Um, and it's essentially for setting up the mercenary to be useful, um, but also with high amounts of magic find. Um, and this is a whole category into itself. Now, um, basically what we're going to be going over today is we're going to be talking about the Act 1 Rogue Mercenary. And specifically, we're going to be talking about, uh, first off, the Ice Mercenary. So the Ice Mercenary has some very specific things that they're capable of doing. Uh, first off is they have Freezing Arrow, which is a very powerful ability. And if you've seen my video on Freezing Arrow, you'll know that Freezing Arrow is a skill that definitely takes advantage from the ability to pierce. Um, on top of this, they also have Cold Arrow, which pretty much sucks. And then they also have Inner Sight, which has a pretty large reduction in enemy defense, which is very useful for a lot of characters like melee characters, uh, even range characters, because it causes the monsters to have relatively no defense. And uh, once they have relatively no defense, well, guess what? You have a uh, much easier time hitting them and you don't need as much attack rating to get the job done. Um, in general, you have to kind of go with what the mercenary is capable of. So this is a ranged mercenary, um, and this particular one is utilizing the Freezing Arrow ability. Now, the Freezing Arrow ability is a very nice ability um, that allows you to dish out a large amount of damage to a large amount of monsters um, relatively easily. Um, but to get the most out of Freezing Arrow, you really need some specific things. Uh, first off is you really need something that allows you to pierce, because without piercing effect, Freezing Arrow basically does nothing. Um, it hits one time, it explodes one time, and it only does one amount of damage. However, if you have 100% pierce, you can potentially pierce up to six times, multiplying the damage in multiple explosions, which can dish out multiple, uh, multiple, multiple amounts of damage, to the point where basically the monsters have absolutely no chance to survive. Um, now, she doesn't always fire Freezing Arrow. She also just simply fires a regular physical damage attack too. So it's important to note that for her, it's not necessarily just elemental damage, but if you want to set her up for an elemental setup, um, you're looking at something along the lines of a Mistbow, 
And the reason why Mist is the most important bow here that you can utilize for pretty much all of these setups when it comes to the elemental damage uh, effects is because it has 100% pierce. There's very few bows in the game that have 100% pierce. And Mist was specifically set up for the purposes of capping out essentially that 100% pierce on this specific character, this, this mercenary. Uh, it was made for the mercenary, in other words. Now, there are other options that I generally tend to use for... Uh, freezing arrow Amazons, and that is Crown of Ages because it has two facets, um, and also Arcane's Valor because it has plus two skills and a facet slot. Uh, but you cannot use these on her because uh, she doesn't really have enough strength. Um, as options go, she only has uh, what is it? Um, she only has 174 with the Chains of Honor, uh, which means that you could use the COA if you have a chains of honor but without the chains of honor it doesn't work um but ethereal nightwings veil also can work here and um for damage output if you're talking about just strictly the freezing arrow damage output two cold faceted coa is superior to nightwings uh that's just how the cookie crumbles there's uh there's no alternative honestly the uh, the difference between the two is actually pretty massive um, because negative resistance is so much more powerful than the plus skill. But she doesn't have a whole lot of negative resistances. Um, so if you wanted to go with, say, the Nightwing's Veil, um, eh, it really doesn't have too much of a difference in effect. There's just, she's going to be able to kill Cold Abunes easier. That's pretty much all there is to it. Um, COA also, of course, is a much more defensive helmet with the 30% faster recovery, the physical damage reduction, which you don't have the 30% faster recovery and the physical damage reduction on Nightwings, um, which makes COA an even better choice. But like I said, to do this, you would need Chains of Honor. Now, another option that you could potentially do, which is a very nice one, is the Bone Flesh. Uh, bone Flesh can be upgraded um, two, two times, but you would only upgrade it once for this particular character. And you might be asking, well, why Bone Flesh specifically? Well, she's already capped out on resistances. Uh, Mist gives her pretty much all the resistances that she's ever going to need with the plus 40 all here. Um, and then on top of that, we also get the Open Wounds. Now, having a mercenary with Open Wounds is very effective for any kind of... Uh, caster type. Like if you're not a melee type yourself or if you can't apply open wounds yourself in some way, having bone flesh in the mix allows you to apply open wounds, also gives you a socket which you can add a facet, and on top of that um, it also has life leech, which mist does not have and also Nightwing's Veil does not have. So if you're going to set up a character like this, you're going to want to have Life Leech, and you're going to want to have Open Wounds. Um, so it really depends on how you want to get this set up. If you don't need Open Wounds, then Chains of Honor and COA, I believe, is the better option here. Um, and if you're not interested in the Open Wounds, or if you want the Open Wounds, then your better bet is the Nightwing's Veil and the Bone Flesh. Open Wounds is really nice to prevent uh, regeneration, and it does work surprisingly well. And she will do a significant amount of damage with the Mist Bow because it is a very nice option. Now, for the Mist Bow specifically, if you're going for more of an elemental damage, you want to use the Matriarchal Bow, which is faster. And if you're going for more of a physical damage, then you want to use the Grand Matron Bow, which is the one that is higher damage output, but it's slower. Um, and that's really all there is to it with these two particular abilities. Now, um, she actually will kill pretty significantly fast. Uh, whenever you're fighting a large number of monsters, like for instance, um, I don't know, let's just go somewhere where there's not a lot of cold immunes, because of course she is going to have a little bit of an issue with cold immunes. Let's go to River of Flame. And um, let's let her pew pew these guys to death. As you can see, that nice freezing arrow hits pretty hard. I believe we do have this on P8 as well. Let's uh, let me check here. I usually I usually have it on P8, so let's bring this down to P1 for right now, just for demonstration purposes. Because of course your your mercenary is never really going by herself or himself; they're always going with someone else. So it's kind of important to have a better contrast of you know how how powerful the minion's going to be basically in P1, and then also how powerful they'll be in P2 and cold minions.
And of course, we got gold beads everywhere. Uh, but as you can see in P1, we pre she pretty much just shatters a bunch of monsters with relative ease. This particular setup is not really so much to help you, but it does coincidentally help you with the very nice concentration aura. Um, the thing about this particular build is that it's set up to specifically augment the freezing arrow and to basically make the freezing arrow as best as possible. The 100% pierce makes the freezing arrow obviously hit up to a total of six times. The uh, night wings gives a nice amount of cold damage and the facets give cold damage directly to the freezing arrow which enhances the overall damage of the freezing arrow pretty considerably. Um, Bone flesh is of course getting her the open wounds so that she can prevent regeneration and like I said if you don't need the open wounds then you're better off with this combo which is the Chains of Honor and the Crown of Ages. Now, Chains of Honor is because, of course, Life Leech, and the Crown of Ages is for the two facet slots. That's pretty much the only reason you're using the Crown of Ages over the other items, is the two facets. With this, you will basically have one, two facets total, um, which is at least a nice negative 10% enemy gold resistance and plus 10% skill. But the real meat and potatoes of this is getting the very nice additional skills that come from the MISPA, which is a plus six, and you also get the 100% pierce, which is the most important thing. Now, you can potentially use some other options for this girl, and uh, let's go over some of these other options. Now, first off is the Ice Bow, um, and the Ice Bow, while it is an interesting option, it's not really the best option out there because uh, the main issue is, is that it doesn't have any pierce. However, Despite the fact that it doesn't have any peers, um, it does, however, have the Holy Freeze Aura, uh, which could be very handy to basically augment your mercenary into a more crowd control based type ice merc. Um, this is basically just a way to give your, your mercenary more crowd control. So she already has crowd control with Freezing Arrow, and she already has crowd control with Cold Arrow, and this just gives her a little bit more crowd control by adding in the Holy Freeze effect as well. So that when you take her out into, you know, like, uh, let's go to Cold Plains real quick, um, she can freeze the enemies before they even get to her, which is really nice. And, you know, just like the Act 2 Holy Freeze mark, you now have a pretty effective mercenary. The other thing is, is the Ice Bow also has the Nova effect on it. Um, and the Nova effect is going to give you a pretty decent uh, crowd control effect there, too. So basically, the Ice Bow really just gives you a large amount of crowd control, but it's not going to be superior damage-wise because of the lack of piercing effect. Um, another option that you could potentially use, which I don't really think is a good one, um, is a fully upgraded Wizen Draw. Uh, the fully upgraded Wizen Draw, while it does have a decent amount of damage, nowhere as good as the Mispo and nowhere as good as the Ice Bow. Um, the main draw of the Wizen Draw is the fact that it has negative 40% enemy gold resistance, which is pretty massive. Um, and this would allow her to dish out a large amount of cold damage to cold immune monsters. Um, and if you were setting up a pure cold build and you want to get as much out of this as possible, it'd be interesting. But the main issue, again, with this is that it has no pierce. Um, and because it has no pierce, it's going to be mostly single target damage. Um, and this is the reason why, despite the fact that Ice Bow is a pretty nice option, it's also expensive, by the way. Um, honestly, I think your best bet is with the Mist Bow, uh, the Chains of Honor, and the Crown, Crown of Ages. Now, a cheaper option, of course, is the Bone Flesh and the Nightwing's Veil. Eth Nightwing's Veil is pretty easy to come by because nobody wants it. It's uh, specifically a Merc item. And then uh, Ethereal Bone Flesh is a little bit more expensive, but it's not really super expensive. Um, and it's a decent option as well. Another option that you could potentially go with, of course, is you could go with a Treachery, just simply so you could make the character attack faster. Um, but at that point, you wouldn't have any life leech, uh, which is an issue. Uh, having at least some form of life leech is important. And uh, because the Mistbow has no life leech, and because Crown of Ages has no life leech, and Nightwing's Veil also has no life leech, um, you're kind of left with only the two options of Bone Flesh and Chains of Honor. Those are pretty much the only two life leech armors in the game. Uh, granted, Chains of Honor is amazing with plus two skills, and it also has some massive bonuses like magic find, damage reduction, and so forth and so on. The damage to demons and the damage to undead is also very nice for the physical aspect of the character. Um, but Bone Flesh also has its charm as well with the ability to add a socket, which means you get another facet, and on top of that you also get the open wounds. Uh, moving on from this one, uh, let's move on to the next on the list, uh, which we also have the Rogue Fire. So the Fire Rogue is another um, 
elemental damage character, very similar to the ice. Um, and the freezing arrow ability and the and the uh, f f exploding arrow ability basically function the same. Um, and the reason why they function the same is because, well, they're both Welcome. arrow attacks. They both require large amounts of piercing. Um, and on top of this, not only do they both require large amounts of piercing, but they require large amounts of negative resistance and other things to help them out. Um, and for this reason, there's really only two bow options for the exploding arrow Amazon. Or, sorry, Rogue. Um, now, the, a, I'll say this, though. A budget option would be a Kuko Shikaku or whatever the hell you call that one. It's the unique bow that is a nightmare difficulty bow, and you can upgrade it into the hell difficulty. It is not going to be the best bow, but it does have 50% pierce on it, which is better than zero. Um, and it is set up specifically for fire damage. Um, however, it's not going to beat out Mist. Mist is going to be superior by far. Um, Mist isn't even really that expensive with a Cham and Gull. It's... It's kind of cheap. Chams only um, aren't really worth very much at the end or at the beginning of the ladder or the end of the ladder, to be honest. Um, you can usually pick them up relatively inexpensive. And um, honestly, the main problem would be finding a really nice mist base in a Grand Matron bow. So a really nice, like, 15% enhanced five-socket mist bow. Um, the other option that you could potentially use is Hand of Justice. Uh, Hand of Justice has some interesting effects. Number one, it has Life Leech, which does allow you to use alternative armor options. Um, you could potentially use, say, a Bramble, or um, you know, if you wanted Thorns, or you could use some other various pieces like Treachery and whatnot. This will allow her to attack faster, and it's going to allow you to dish out more physical damage, like single target physical damage. The main problem with Hand of Justice is, again, it doesn't have any pierce. And uh, because it doesn't have any pierce, you're not going to get the nice exploding arrow damage going on as she fires through multiple targets. Um, this build is one that honestly, I think that despite the fact that Hand of Justice could be interesting, I still think Mist is the superior choice when it comes to this particular build, the fire build. Um, and, and it really just has to do with the piercing effects. Now, Flickering Flame is a really good choice because it has the negative enemy fire resistance, and it also has the plus three fire skills, which does, in fact, affect Exploding Arrow. Um, and then for the armor choices, again, you're pretty much left with the Chains of Honor and the Bone Flesh, again, for either the Open Wounds or the... Well, increased physical damage. Now, I don't necessarily think that... Crown of Ages is the best choice in the world, but I do like the fact that it has both negative fire resistance and plus fire skill damage, as well as an additional fire damage of 34 to 90. And the 34 to 90 fire damage might not seem like a lot, but I've actually started to encounter that when it comes to this particular character, or these, these skills that multiply damage in the way they do, even a small amount of additional fire damage can potentially stack up to a rather large amount. So while Flickering Flame is definitely an option, and can give you, of course, the utility of having the fire resistance aura which is which is actually really nice to be perfectly honest um, another option would be to utilize the chains of honor and the crown of ages together um, which would give you a pretty decent negative 10 negative or plus 10 percent fire skill damage with plus one to skills um, you would lose two skills and you would also lose a five percent negative resistance which is unfortunate, but you do gain 15% physical damage reduction and you gain 10% fire skill damage as well as the 34 to 90 fire damage, which multiplies out quite nicely in the grand scheme of things to give you a rather large bump in total damage output. Um, I can't really like multiply it out for you right now because it depends on what monsters you're dealing with, but it, trust me when I say that like that 34 to 90, basically 90 gets multiplied twice per shot. And uh, when you hit the monster and the explosion, it separates it out into two, and it actually applies the 90 two times. So you get one for the hit, and you get one for the explosion. You can have six explosions and six hits, which means you're multiplying 90 times 12, essentially. And then on top of that, the explosions themselves can also hit multiple monsters. So depending on the number of monsters nearby, you get a pretty large bump in damage. 
So COA ends up being a superior choice just simply because it allows you to add more facets. So you get the 100% pierce from the mist bow, you get the two facets here, and then of course you get the chains of honor allows you to put on the COA in the first place. Um, like I said, you could also potentially use bone flesh, same as the previous one, so you can get that open wounds. Um, and if you do use bone flesh, you're probably going to have to use flickering flame because you can't put on the COA without the strength that comes from COA. Uh, or Chains of Honor. Let's go see how she does against um, some monsters real quick. Of course, I've got no HP at the moment, but that's fine. I'll just let her do all the work. Now, the damage of Exploding Arrow really starts to shine when you get a large number of monsters, so let's see if I can try not to die here. <laughs> I got no hit points. It would have been nice if I talked to Mala real quick before I came down here. I'm running around like a chicken with my head cut off. Five. Give me some potions, man. I'm... Good. I can just stand here. Uh, so basically, when you're dealing with this kind of uh, setup, she's basically dishing out a large amount of damage per shot, but only when she's using the exploding arrow. And that's one of the things that I don't like about the like the way that she fires, because most Amazons, they would sit there and they would fire Exploding Arrow constantly. Also, she tends to fire a lot better if you are, of course, actually fighting with her instead of letting her die, which is what I'm currently doing. Uh, but as you can see, she did pretty well on her own and managed to kill Eldritch with no problem. Another interesting quirk about the uh, Rogue is that the rogue also has the ability to fire every single time you teleport, which is quite nice. In this particular build, another interesting thing about this build is that she's strongly affected by enchant. So if you are an enchant sorceress, you might want to consider setting up an enchant minion like this because she can benefit from your massive enchant and she can basically get a second damage bump uh, and basically including your enchant. She multiplies that damage again and is just out even more damage, which basically allows you to have an enchant minion and your enchant sorceress at the same time, essentially doubling the damage output that you get from your enchant ability. Now, granted, she doesn't have fire mastery, so she doesn't get the full bonus, but she does get a large increase in damage that is going to add to the exploding arrow and also to her on hit and is going to give her a pretty huge damage bump. Um, on my Enchant Sorceress, I actually run this specific setup um, because the Mist Bow gives that 100% pierce, the Enchant gives her a huge damage bump, and then she can dish out a lot more damage alongside me. Um, now, this isn't the end of it. Um, there's also other ways that you could potentially set up your Act 1 Mercenary. Um, another very interesting way is Utility. So utility is another way that you could potentially set up mercenaries, and it basically involves around setting up the mercenary to support you. Now there's a big difference between setting up the mercenary to support you and setting up the mercenary, mercenary to support itself. Um, and as I talked about earlier at the beginning of this video, um, for the merc is the first way you can set up. Tanking is another, and utility, which is set up to assist the player, is a completely different way. Now there's a lot of neat ways that you can set up this mercenary for utility, um, and they basically revolve around things like the edge bow, uh, which can give thorns, of course. Um, and let's go ahead and grab one of these. It really doesn't matter which one we get. Um, when you're setting up for utility, you're really going to set up for what it is that you need. Uh, do you need crowd control? Then you're probably going to go with the freezing arrow. In my personal opinion, the freezing arrow one is the superior choice in 99% of situations. The only time you really don't want the freezing arrow version is when you don't want to destroy bodies. Um, and there's only a couple characters in the game that are, you know, addicted to corpses, which is the necromancer and, of course, the item find barbarian and then perhaps if you want to throw that in there we could throw in the death century assassin but for the most part most characters don't really care if the corpses are destroyed so when it comes to setting up a utility act one rogue i usually go with the ice unless i need corpses and if i need corpses then i go with the fire now, um, one way that you can set up your utility mercenary is you can go with a double edge bramble setup, uh, which is going to add the thorns together. So you're going to end up with a 15 plus 21, uh, which is going to give you a level 31 
right? 30, 30, no, 36, level 36, right? So level 36 thorns total, which is going to be a pretty beast setup as far as, say, like uh, mercenary for, say, a necromancer. Uh, if you're trying to get, like, ridiculous thorns, uh, for whatever reason, if you want a ridiculously large amount of thorns, this is a very interesting way to give yourself a very high level of thorns, which can cause a pretty decent amount of reflect. Now, one thing I would recommend with this setup is that if you're going with some type of thorn setup, setup you need also need some way to arrest regeneration. Um, and arresting regeneration will help thorns tremendously. I've discovered this through my testing that thorns is not really bad. Um, and it's important to note this. Thorns is not really bad. It's just... It, it just doesn't really work well against the regeneration which is present within the game on a regular basis. So when the monster hits you and they dish out whatever damage that they're dishing out, the main issue is that, well, they regenerate so quickly that it doesn't really matter that you did the damage to them because for the most part, you're going to run into situations where the monsters are regenerating faster than, than they hit, not faster than the thorns dishes out damage. Um, and it has something really to do with the fact that the monsters just attack really, really slowly um, by comparison to a lot of other monsters. And so, of course, they attack so slowly that they end up basically causing, you know, like an issue in the regeneration of how fast they're taking damage and whatnot. It's, it's not really the greatest. Um, but having level 30 six thorns is certainly nothing to sneeze at because it's a pretty large amount of damage in return. Now, another interesting way that you could potentially set up your mercenary, um, besides, of course, the thorns route, is you can, of course, go with the insight route. Now, insight is a very powerful option that will give you a large amount of regeneration. I personally don't like to run insight unless I absolutely have to. And the reason is, is because while insight does give you a huge amount of regeneration, it also kind of consumes a slot that you could be using for something more powerful. My personal opinion is, is if you can do without insight, you can eventually make your character so powerful that, well, it doesn't necessarily matter. Um, you know, like you're, you're just, you're going to get a huge amount of damage bump by setting up your mercenary for a damage output setup as opposed to a utility setup. And insight just happens to be one of those utility setups that you could potentially do without. Um, another interesting way that you can set up your mercenary for utility is things like the cure helmet, uh, which is really nice if you do tend to teleport a lot or if you're a ranged character in general because you can stand next to her. Uh, it's only level one though, so do keep that in mind and it doesn't go very far. Um, so if you are planning to utilize it, um, you know, keep in mind that if you walk away from her too far, um, it will disappear. Um, however, one of the thing that's really interesting, as I was talking about earlier, is if you teleport, obviously you're going to teleport directly on top of each other. And uh, it's actually really useful because you teleport together. And so as you're teleporting together, the aura will, of course, stay active on you all the time. Um, it's actually a pretty neat item to set up for the mercenary. But do keep in mind that because the insight bow has no life leech and because cure has no life leech, at this point you are relegated to something along the lines of like a bone flesh. Uh, which I have the Bone Flesh Hellforge plate right now, uh, but uh, you would probably want the Bone Flesh Templar coat, uh, which would be one upgrade up, not two. Um, or you would want something like Chains of Honor or um, for the Life Leech, because it, basically what this does is it forces you into a scenario where you're stuck with a non-Life Leech armor, which is unfortunate. Um, honestly, the main thing when it comes to a support mercenary is that they don't die. Um, and I think that's, that's honestly the best thing that I can tell you is that um, if you're setting up a mercenary specifically for support, for insight, bramble, whatever, you really want to set them up with tankier equipment so that they don't end up dying all the time. And if you make them too weak, like if their resistances are too bad or if they're constantly like having trouble with damage reduction or things like that, it'd be an issue. Chains of Honor is probably a good play here when it comes to the Insight Bow Merc, because if you're going with the Cure Helmet, you get Life Leech and you get plus the skills and you get all resistances, which will cap that out. Give her a little bit of damage reduction, which will make her a little bit tankier and less likely to die. Um, if you don't go with the Cure Helmet and you go instead with something like, say, Bulwark, um, or if you go with, say, Andariel's Visage, um, you, of course, open up your body slot to a lot of different options, and you could potentially get, you know, a, a lot of different stuff. Usually, and it's been my experience, when it comes to 
Insight Bowmerks is that most of the time when people are running Insight Bowmerks, they're probably a caster. Um, and because they're probably a caster, they are going to need open wounds. So do keep this in mind that the bone flesh with the open wounds is a really good choice here for a caster because it's going to offer you the opportunity to get open wounds from your mercenary so you don't have to worry about the monsters regenerating all the time. And while she might die, certainly, um, you can, of course, go with a much tankier helmet as a result, so you've got other options. Uh, Flickering Flame is also a pretty interesting option. We talked about that with the Fire version, but it's also another way that you can add in more utility to the character so you can have more auras. In fact, if you go with, say, uh, Bramble... Flickering Flame and Insight, now you have Thorns, Fire Resistance, Aura, and Meditation at the same time. Or you could potentially go with the Cure, which of course is going to give you um, the Cleansing Aura. But the uh, the problem with, of course, stacking on too many of these is you lose any kind of Life Leech or Survivability, and the Mercenary starts to become more and more easily killable. Um, so it really depends on how you want to set up this utility, utility Mercenary for yourself. Now, there is another utility bow, and I saved that for the next setup, which is the physical version of the rogue. Now, not all of the rogues have to be set up for an elemental damage setup. Um, you can, of course, set up your rogue for a physical damage setup, and uh, a very good way to set up for a physical setup is by utilizing the faith bow. Now, uh, the faith bow, I think, is... Probably the best bow for the mercenary, but Mist is also a very strong competitor for this particular reason. And I'll go over the pros and the cons of both of these real quick. Another uh, cheaper option, which is also really nice, is the Witch Wild String, uh, which does have to be upgraded to its final version, which is the Diamond Bow. Um, and the reason why the Witch Wild String comes in with an interesting option is basically that it allows the mercenary to get amplified damage which is pretty nice. You have a 2% chance of level 5 amp on striking, um, and it can help tremendously in her physical damage output. Now, um, utility-wise, these are all interesting options because, of course, you get the Fanaticism Aura through the Faith Bow. Um, you get the Mist, gives you Concentration Aura, and, of course, the Witch Wild String gives you the Amplified Damage on Striking. Now, you could get Amplified Damage on Striking in other ways, like Atmos Scarab, uh, or you could be running... Um, the uh, brand bow on yourself. I mean, there's a couple different options for amplify damage, but um, it's this is definitely one of them. You know, usually for the witch wild string, um, you usually go with a faster damage output. So what you're really looking for with witch wild string is usually two shale runes, uh, just so you can get it as fast as humanly possible and uh, and dish out as much damage as you can. Usually using something like strafe to get the amplify damage to proc now on the mercenary however you can't really do that and that's part of the problem um so you're stuck in a situation where you kind of just have to choose between what you want now faith bow is definitely the higher single target damage option um, it has the fanaticism aura which of course is going to speed her up tremendously it also allows her to dish out a lot more damage with the fanaticism aura and she also gets well, a lot of fun little things with this one like the plus two to all skills the plus three on the bow itself i don't know why it's only a plus two there but you get plus five total whereas you only get you get plus six from the miss bow so they're both pretty comparable both of them give increased physical damage as well um, the real difference between these two is that of course again the mist bow allows her to hit multiple targets which is another interesting option so when you're dealing with the physical damage you notice that her physical damage is 597 to 2052 um, and we put the faith bow on and she's at 526 to 1,772. Um, so she's still going to have a pretty comparable amount of damage between the two, but it, it's it's my personal opinion that if you're looking for AoE damage, like you want her to hit multiple targets and dish out more damage to multiple targets, then your Mist Bow is going to be the better option. If you want the single target damage, then Faith Bow is going to be the better option. Both of these are absolutely amazing for, say, like... Necromancer minions, um, druid minions, of course, even if you're doing a Amazon and you just want to have the additional fanaticism aura. Of course, faith is much more expensive, too. 
uh, at with the jaw in there, the ohm jaw, it does come in a lot higher on the list in terms of cost. And there's no guarantee that you're going to end up with a perfect roll on the Fanaticism Aura either. Um, the Misbo, on the other hand, is much cheaper, and it's going to give you a lot more bang for your buck, in my opinion, just in general. So let's put the Mistbow back on. Now, um, when it comes to physical damage output, um, there are two really good options, and it really comes down to either Fortitude, Chains of Honor, or Treachery. They're all really good options for this particular character. Uh, Fortitude is going to give a large amount of on hit. As you can see, she goes up to 3,174 damage. And then uh, Chains of Honor, while it doesn't show that she gets a large amount of damage, she does get the 200% damage to demons and the 100% damage to undead uh, from this, which is pretty darn nice. So it's not exactly a slouch of an armor either by comparison to Fortitude, but I would say I think that Fortitude is a little bit tankier with the huge amount of defense bonus that she gets uh, from, of course, the... Um, the chilling armor proc, which is really nice. So she does get that. She doesn't really need the resistances anyway, which is a whole other thing. And uh, it basically just gives her the ability to dish out a lot more physical damage. Now, if you have your own kind of amplify damage or decrepify being procced from other sources, then, you know, it's going to be even better. Um, for her helmet, um, generally it comes down to speed. Um, this G-Face, I do have it here just to demonstrate, it does come with Deadly Strike, which is nice, but Crushing Blow just doesn't really work as effectively for ranged attacks as uh, it does on melee, and I don't really think it's the best option for her. Um, and Daryl's Visage with the increased attack speed and with another increased attack speed jewel is probably going to be a better choice. And of course you could always go with a increased attack speed build where you run treachery for the 45% increased attack speed and then you get a 15% IAS jewel throw it in here so you have a 35% increased attack speed um, and um, she could be attacking at a rather considerable rate uh, and it really depends on how you want to get her set up and running uh, if you were going to go with the amp damage build I would definitely recommend running the increased attack speed because you want her to attack as fast as possible to get as much damage output as she can and, of course, I forgot to actually grab the potions again. Let's see if she can dish out her damage without me dying. Yeah, she's stuck. Now she has no choice but to fight. <laughs> As you can see, she can put out some pretty significant amounts of damages. Um, and with the Pierce, of course, she can do more damage to more targets quicker. Now, the Fanaticism Bow um, for an attack speed build would be, of course, even better. And she would probably hit the highest attack speed possible with a setup like this, running a 15% IAS jewel like Treachery and Faith. Um, I'd have to run the calculations on it to see exactly how much she needs to hit her breakpoints. But I'm pretty sure that she's about as fast as she's ever going to get when it comes to her physical damage. The Faith Bow also has the added benefit of reanimating corpses, which is kind of fun. It's basically just an additional way to make some distractions. But as you can see, she doesn't really do a lot of AoE damage anymore with the Faith Bow. She's now only hitting one target at a time, which isn't really the greatest. And if we're talking about her specific physical damage output, while yes, we've increased her physical damage output considerably in her single target, we've also now lost all of the AoE damage that she could potentially be doing. Uh, which means that Mistbo, again, is unfortunately the winner. Because it just, that AoE damage that she can do, that piercing effect that allows her to 100% pierce through targets, is always going to be better damage-wise when you're talking about any kind of packs. Um, which, if she was fighting bosses, like if it's your goal to fight bosses, then you might want to give her the Faith Bow. Because the Faith Bow is going to be better versus those bosses. But when it comes to any kind of pack fighting, if you're fighting any kind of like elites, champions, um, if you're doing Bale Waves, like it doesn't really matter. There's so many different options for her to dish out, you know, multiple damage. Uh, obviously, up to six hits in one shot that uh, the 100% Pierce just makes more sense when you're talking about trying to get set, set her up for damage output. Um, I think that's pretty much it when it comes to the Bow Girl. The Bow Girl doesn't really have, like, 
the most ridiculous options, but she does have a lot of utility in that she can use the Bramble Armor, she can use the Cure Helmet, of course. She can also use the Insight Bow, uh, the Faith Bow, the Mist Bow, and uh, there's actually a lot of other interesting choices as well. But when it really comes down to her endgame setup, um, that's really all there is to it. I'd also like to talk a minute about Treachery and how effective it is. I do think that Treachery is cheaper and more effective than, say, Fortitude or Chains of Honor. Um, but the main issue that I find with Treachery over Fortitude and Chains of Honor is basically that Treachery is not good for fast farming. Um, and what do I mean by fast farming? Well, if you're constantly, you know, like save and exit, you know, you're joining, I'm going to go run my pindle, you go, you know, you go run your pindle or you go run your, your trav or whatever, the chances of her treachery being activated before you run tra your pindle, before you run that, it's not going to be very good. Um, and in the grand scheme of things, for the most part, she's just not going to generally have her treachery active when she needs it. Um, it's also important to talk about this, and a lot of people get confused on this, and I just want to make sure that you are aware of this, is there is a penalty um, for mercenaries that basically involves bosses, so act bosses. Act bosses deal 400, I believe it's 400%, more damage to essentially any mercenary. Um, so if, you're, you know, you, if your mercenary does really well at just basically all content, and then all of a sudden it feels like she's not really doing the best in like against act bosses, like the act bosses tend to just rip her to shreds. Um, well, I mean, that's just the way the cookie crumbles. Act bosses get so much additional damage bonus against minions that it really makes it very difficult to set up a minion tanky enough to be able to like go toe to toe with act bosses. And um, it really takes some high tier, like freaking S plus equipment with like God level stats to be able to make that happen. Um, and there's really not a lot much more to it than that. Um, I think I've covered pretty much everything, but if you have any specific questions about more specific setups or why you would choose one particular setup over the other, um, I mean, I can go over that briefly as well. You know, I might as well since I'm already 40, min 40 minutes into the video here. But um, basically how it works is you choose your mercenary basically to assist your character. That's usually what you do. Um, even when you're choosing the damage type, so even when you're choosing this type, you're still technically choosing it to support you, right? So, you know, if you're a sorceress, you might choose a melee type, which would end up being your tank, so it's designed not to die, right? But you're not necessarily choosing how to set up the mercenary specifically for you, you're just choosing the mercenary type to go with the character that you're playing. Um, and for the most part, when it comes to the Act 1 Rogue, she's a very interesting choice for a lot of characters. Like if you want high levels of thorns, if you just want to have a mercenary that hangs in the back and doesn't die all the time. Um, she's a lot less likely to run in there and get herself killed, although she still does it occasionally. And... Um, on top of that, um, it's pretty easy to find yourself a nice four-socket bow for an, infin an insight if you're looking for it. And Mist is actually one of the best options for this uh, freaking mercenary. And it's not actually really all that expensive. Um, while some of the choices that you could potentially use for mercenaries like, you know, Chains of Honor and Fortitude and... Um, you know, like there's Last Wish and all sorts of other things in the game and Faith Bow and all that crap. To be honest with you, the Mist Bow is quite honestly the cheapest out of a lot of those and literally the most effective for the Act 2 or Act 1 Rogue. Um, it's just best in slot for physical, it's best in slot for the elemental builds, and uh, it also has a very nice utility of giving, of course, the concentration aura to everyone. Um, there are other bows and other ways that you can potentially set her up, but honestly, it feels like the Mist Bow pretty much became the best option for the Act 1 Rogue, like bar none. Anyway, as always, I do appreciate you guys and gals watching my videos. Uh, the next episode is going to be on the Act 2 Mercenary, which is going to take some time. Um, and uh, we're going to go over a lot of setups on that. Uh, as always, thanks for watching. And uh, if you enjoy watching the videos, be sure to hit the like button and keep watching.